Hello, everyone out there. My name is Dan Brewer. We'll wait a few moments while um, we have some people joining, and then uh, we'll get started here just in uh, just in a bit. All right, we'll have, uh, I'm sure, some some more jump on, but uh, hey, happy to uh, be co-hosting this today and uh, talking about uh, some topics that are very pertinent to to us as as business owners and and those that serve businesses. So today we'll we'll be talking about mastering small business taxes and uh, the benefit of benefiting your employees. So excited to get into it. All right. And then just a little uh, webinar 101. We're going to send the recording and all the resources out to everyone right after the webinar. And, uh, you know, we, we want this to be uh, interactive. So, um, you know, please, you know, we welcome your questions. Please drop them in the question box uh, throughout the presentation and we'll make sure that we uh you know um uh, address those the best that we can and make sure that uh we're uh keeping everybody well informed all right <clears throat> we'll go ahead and uh get into it and do some intros my name is uh dan brewer again i'm the I'm the VP of Business Development at Advanced Staff HR. Um, we are a uh, professional employment organization in uh, Las Vegas. And I have uh, I've been in the industry for, for about over 20 years. And, um, you know, super excited to, to, to be here and, and working with, uh, you know, our, um, with Adam, who's actually presenting this and and is kind of the, the the genius behind it. So I'll, I'll turn it over to him for for his intro. Adam. Hey Dan, how are you doing? Good. Very good. All right. Well, so just to give you a brief introduction. So my name is Adam Hudson. I'm a certified public accountant and. Um, I have been uh, running my own practice here in Las Vegas, Nevada for almost 20 years now. So I've almost got it figured out. Uh, a few more years and I should have it. Uh, but this presentation is just going to be talking about the benefit of benefiting your employees and the importance of that. So I appreciate everybody uh, attending. Wonderful. And then um, also on, and she'll be working feverishly behind the scenes is our senior director of HR, uh, Rebecca Woods. And she has um, a lot of, of invaluable experience when it comes to these topics. And so we're thankful for her and, and her contributions to uh, keeping us well informed and, and questions answered. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks, Becky. All right. Um, so, hey, for today's agenda, um, these are some of the topics that that we'll be discussing, but really the relationship between small business and tax reduction opportunities and also the role that PEOs can play in them. And then uh, key business tax reductions um, that really are just related to the benefit products that you can find um, through a PEO and, and really 
keyed in on the back end by, you know, a, a trusted accounting team, like you'll find with, with Adam and his firm. And really that just kind of goes into the power of, of partnership and the synergy we, we create together and in, in serving uh, the business community. Thanks, Dan. So before we start this presentation, though, I want to tell a little story that I heard uh, several years ago. So this is a story about an employer who um, one day shows up, drives up into his, uh, into his office parking lot, driving a brand new Lamborghini. And as he pulls it into the parking lot and then walks into the office, one of his employees says, wow, that is such a great car. And he's, that employee is really impressed by that. And so the, the business owner talks to the employer and says, hey, you know what? Let me just tell you the secret. So if you work hard and learn everything about this business and hit all of your numbers, then next year I'll be able to buy another one of those. Okay. So that's, uh, that's kind of an old school paradigm of how we used to run business. But now what's happened is that uh, – the landscape with our employees is, is drastically changed. You'll find that it's very difficult now to find new employees. It's more difficult now to keep the new employees. It's very expensive to having all that turnover. And so now, instead of just taking for granted the fact that we can have all these employees that will, will come to work for us, we actually now have to do some proactive things in order to keep them. So um, so we're going to talk about that. But before I get into uh, some of the presentation, I have a couple of disclaimers that the attorneys make me uh, share with you. So one, nothing in this presentation should be considered tax or legal advice. Uh, if you find any of these um, any of these points in this presentation, uh, something that you want to try to implement on, with your business, then we recommend that you discuss those specific points with your CPA or attorney. Make sure that those are right for you. And then the examples that we are going to show today, uh, those examples are going to use just some, some general calculations. So your mileage may vary when adopting these. So your percentages or your tax rates may be higher or lower than what we've done here today. So you want to make sure that when you're considering adding benefits to your business, that, um, you, know, that you double check the numbers to make sure that they still hold true when they're applied to your specific circumstances. So that getting out of the way uh, to make the lawyers happy. So what we're gonna talk about here is that now what you're facing is that the bottom line is that because of all the inflation, all the things that have gone on in the economy, you basically need to start paying your employees more in order to keep them. Otherwise they're gonna go somewhere else, okay? And the easiest way for you to, to provide them uh, to more is just to pay them cash. Okay. There's nothing that you have to do special with cash is that you just decide um, that you're just going to put the, you know, give them a raise, either an hourly raise or a monthly raise or however it is that you pay them. That money goes right onto their, their normal paycheck gets included on their W2 at the end of the year. So let's just take a look at an example of what happens when you do that. So in this example that we're going to use today, let's say that you as the employer wants to pay each of their employees an extra $500 a month uh, that you're just gonna do as cash compensation because that's super easy to do. So here's the way that this breaks down. So when you pay $500 per month to your employees, there are additional payroll taxes that you have to pay. You've got FICA, you've got Medicare, you may have state unemployment tax, you have workers comp, uh, different taxes like that, so it makes it so that you are actually going to be paying $548 a month um, instead of $500 a month. And then when your employee receives that $500 on their paycheck, uh, they're going to have payroll taxes that are taken out of that as well. So the net benefit to the employee of your $500 raise is that they're only going to see $462 of that in their actual paycheck. So basically what's happening now is that the employee is only getting 84% of the money that you're trying to pay them, okay? And, and so that's a problem. Uh, and here's where the disconnect comes in. So, you know, when you talk like in parties and things like that, you're going to talk to like your friends say, you know what, I just gave my employees a raise because I'm a great boss and whatever. 
But the on, like, if you really want to be honest, the reason why you're giving your employees a raise is because you're expecting to be able to earn more money than what you're paying the employees, right? And every employer wants their employees to give 110%. Um, so if you're giving them $500 a month extra, you're expecting to get $550 of benefit back, but the employees are only getting 84% of that money. And so we're expecting 110% when they're only getting 84%. And that's kind of where the disconnect comes in of what our expectations are. So the solution to this is that maybe there's a better way instead of just giving them cash where we can give them something of more value that they actually can uh, benefit more from. And so that's what we're gonna go through on this presentation is we're gonna show you what some of those options are. And the first option is, uh, is kind of the go-to standard, right? So anytime an employee is going to be interviewing, one of the main questions that they're always gonna ask is, you know, do you provide benefits? The main benefit that they're talking about is health insurance. And a lot of times, especially small employers, they don't necessarily want to provide health insurance for one reason, because it's expensive. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that here. But with health insurance, there are a ton of plans available. And if you've ever shopped for health insurance, uh, there's different gold, bronze, silver packages, uh, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 10, 13, whatever, right? It's like reading an encyclopedia trying to figure out like which of those plans are. So there are various plans uh, that can apply to basically anybody. Uh, but when you are adopting some of these plans, one of the rules is that you generally can't discriminate. Like you can't give yourself a Cadillac plan uh, and give the employees like a like the worst bottom of the barrel plan. So there are some rules like that. But typically when you're in this relationship where you're providing health insurance, one of the things that most employers will do is they'll pay for 50% of the employee's premium. So for example, if you have a, uh, let's say that you select a $500 premium for your employee, well, you're going to pay $250 of that as a benefit. And then the employee, they will pay $250 of that out of their paycheck on that. Um, and if they have uh, a lot of the health insurance policies, they'll have an option for, uh, for family coverage. So you may decide that you want to pay for some of the family coverage, or you may decide that you may not. Right. So if uh, if you have an employee, they're married, they have a couple of kids uh, and their premium happens to be like fifteen hundred dollars, then your deal could still be that, hey, we'll pay for 50 percent of the employee portion, which is two fifty. And then the employee can pay for all the rest of it on top of that. Uh, just to round out the, the health insurance, though, uh, health insurance can also include uh, vision insurance and it can include dental insurance. And then from an accounting standpoint, what happens is that whatever it is that you do that you'll, you know, that you agree with the employee for your benefit, then you're going to pull that money out of their paycheck um, to pay the premium, uh, you know, each month to the to the insurance company. So, again, we could go on for the whole entire presentation just talking about health insurance, but that's kind of the basics. So let's take a look at then what happens uh, in like real dollar amounts uh, in this scenario. So. For our example today, we're going to say that you find a $500 monthly health insurance policy. The employee is going to pay 50% of that. And so now you're going to be $250 out of pocket um, on the employer side. And then the employee is going to basically get a $500 health insurance package that they're only paying $250 from. So the way I look at that is that they're getting $250 of free health insurance. And so when we look at that, the employer pays 250, the employee receives 250. And so now instead of that 84% uh, value that the employee was getting, we've now just raised that up to 100%. And sometimes depending on the employees and depending on the, uh, the size of your company, you can actually get them a better health insurance policy than what they can buy on their own. Um, so they, you may be paying in $250 a month on their behalf, but you may have a policy that's to them is worth six, seven, or eight hundred dollars. Um, so you're actually getting more value. We didn't model that part out. We're just saying just straight across the board, this is what the value of that premium is. And so this is just the first example of now of that using benefits. We're not losing 16% to the government. 100% uh, of what we're paying uh, is now going to the employee. So 
that's kind of one of the, the first ones that you'd want to take a look at. But 100%, even though that sounds good, I think that we can do better. So one of the things that we see a lot is that when people will set up their health insurance plan, they just leave it at that. The employee pays for their share. But there's a big problem, especially with the current tax code today. And that problem is that when an employee pays for their own health insurance, they very rarely will get a tax deduction for them because health insurance, it gets included as an itemized deduction on their on their 1040. For the vast majority of filers nowadays, um, they don't even itemize. But even if they were to itemize, then their amount of health insurance premiums would have to exceed seven and a half percent of their income. Mm. Uh, before it even starts to count. And I, will bore you, I won't bore you with the rest of the math that goes with that, other than to say, for the most part, most employees don't get any kind of tax benefit. But there is something, it's called a POP 125 plan. And with a POP 125 plan, when you put that into place, then what happens is that you can then allow the employees to pay their portion of their health insurance pre-tax. And pre-tax is just kind of a fancy way of saying, they're getting a tax deduction for it because they're not including that income on their personal tax return. So uh, with a POP 125 plan, this only applies to their health insurance premiums. Um, and it applies to the money that just comes out of their paycheck. So it all gets done on their, like the payroll company basically will code that in, do it on their payroll software, automatically it's applied to their W-2. Um, and then they basically get a tax deduction for that. Now, one of the things that we do find uh, that people will make a mistake on is that they'll think that they have a POP 125 plan when they don't. Um, so you actually do need to go to a benefits person to set this up. You have to have the document that says that you're allowed to do this in order to make that uh, in order to make that legal. Uh, but once you have that document in place, then the payroll company does all the work after that even in year two, year three, year four, year five, and then going forward. Uh, and then that gets handled automatically. And now when we go back and check the math on all of this, so let's use that same example of where the uh, the business is paying $500 monthly, $500 monthly health insurance, uh, employer pays 50%, the employee pays 50%. But now because we've added this POP 125 plan to the mix, now, me as the employer, I'm only paying $250 a month, but the employee is getting $305 of value because now they're getting tax savings um, on top of what they're paying for. So now we're actually able to provide more than 100% of value to the employee because we've added this one extra feature, which a lot of people will omit. So, um, so that's moving us in the right direction, I feel like, but... There's one other thing that I think we can do just a little bit better. Uh, and then that takes me into something that's called a health savings account. So and then, if you, yeah, so if you are, um, uh, so when we get to the health savings account as an example, uh, this actually is the rock star of like tax planning uh, things that we're doing right now with, with our, our clients. Whether or not you're doing this as the employer or you can even do this as the employee, but the health savings account is a great tool uh, for a number of reasons. So first of all, anytime that you'll make a contribution into your health savings account, um, you get a deduction for that. You know, it's done pre-tax. Uh, so that's how you get your deduction. And any money that you put into the health savings account, if you don't use it by the end of the year, it can be invested and carried over to a future year. Uh, with a health savings account, once it gets set up, your employer can actually make contributions to that tax-free um, so that you get a benefit that way. Um, and if for whatever reason, right, if you're just piling money into your HSA account uh, and you don't use it by the time that you retire, you can actually pull money out as additional, as retirement income uh, without penalty, uh, once you reach retirement age. So it kind of can be used for a ton of different things. And the other cool thing about the HSA is that you actually have all the way up until April 15th of next year to fund it for this year. So you don't even have to make uh, the contribution in the year that you're trying to get the deduction for. And more importantly, you don't even have to have the medical expense 
in this year in order to get the deduction for it. Because as soon as you put the money into the HSA, um, that's when you get the tax deduction for that. Um, and so in 2024, now these numbers change every year, so you want to just double check that. But in 2024, if you're an individual, you can put up to $4,100, $4,150 into, uh, into an HSA account. Or if you have a family HSA account, um, you can put up to $8,300 into that. Um, the one kind of downside with the health savings account is that you've got to make sure that you have a high deductible health plan in order to make that contribution. So when you're going back, if we go back, you know, several slides, we talked about setting up your health insurance. If this is a strategy that you want to use, you'll want to make sure that the, the medical plan that you pick is HSA qualified. Now, the big thing with, with these plans that most people will look at is the deductible. And I remember when these plans came out, I don't know, probably 20 some odd years ago, uh, when they said that they needed to have a high deductible plan, that high deductible was like $10,000 or $12,000. It's like ridiculous. Um, so not a lot of people did that. So over the years, they've lowered it. So now the the IRS can sit, considers a health insurance plan that is uh, that has a deductible of $1,600 to be a high deductible health plan. Or if you've got a family plan, $3,200. So the, the bar to get into one of these plans now is, is very low. So let's take, take a look now when we add all three of these together to see what the math comes out to be. So, um, so now we have the exact same situation, but what we've done here is we've added on to it that um, the employer is going to, uh, to help set up this HSA for the employee. Uh, the employer puts $75 into this plan for the employee. And then because the employee knows that they are going to have more uh, medical expenses than just uh, that $75, they throw in another hundred bucks a month. And so therefore they get a like, tax savings of $22 a month from their contribution. And so now we have a situation where as the employer, I put in $325 a month, um, but now my employee is getting $402 of value kind of at the minimum, but if they were to go in and max it out and put all $4,000 into the HSA, then their value would actually be significantly higher. Um, and so that's why we Wait. like this plan here um, because it just offers so much flexibility with the when you add the HSA to it. Hey, Adam, we got a couple questions uh, out here in the Q&A box, which is great. Um, first one, does the HSA money roll over to future years or is it use it or lose it? Yeah, and that's a great question because especially now, you're gonna see a lot of advertisements on TV or on the radio where people are gonna say, you're just gonna hear, hey, you've gotta use your benefits here before the end of the year or you lose it, right? And what that advertisement is talking about is a different type of a plan that's called a flexible spending account. And the flexible spending account is different because one, um, if you don't use all of the money that you put in by the end of the year, you you lose it. So that's where the, the use it or lose it kind of phrase comes from. And two, um, and this is just kind of me not liking to do a lot of extra paperwork, but with the flexible spending account, you actually have to administer that as the employer. So like when um, mm -hmm. you'll pull money out of the employee's paycheck, when they have some kind of a medical expense, they bring you the receipt and then you reimburse them. Right now, me personally, I don't necessarily want to see all of the medical receipts of my employees. I feel like that's kind of none of my business. Um, so that's the reason why I don't particularly care for for that particular uh, the flexible spending account. Normally, when you have a HSA, normally you'll have like a third party administrator. And then once that gets set up, then that account actually belongs to the employee. So it doesn't matter. They could work for you for a day. They could work for you for 10 years. They could go off somewhere else. That money is theirs and they take it with them whenever they, you know, wherever they go. And then if they want to get a reimbursement from that, they contact the third party administrator and send the receipts to them to get the reimbursement. So as the employer, I'm basically out, right? I drop my $75 a month or whatever I decide to do. Um, I drop that into the account. Uh, and then I don't touch it anymore. I don't administer it anymore. Um, I just say, 
you know, there you go, you're welcome, and then move on. Yeah. And so just to clarify, and I think you did, but just to make sure. So even if that employee resigns, they're let go, it's their account and you're you're clean as an employer. Exactly. Now it can be a little Great. tricky for the employee because if they resign and they no longer have the health insurance, as an example, um, they may mm -hmm. not be able to make future contributions to it. Um, but the money that's in there is theirs forever uh, or until they spend it. Perfect. Thanks. So when you're setting up kind of the, the core benefits, you know, health insurance is one of the core benefits, but that's not the only thing out there. Another very popular benefit uh, that can be set up is the, the 401k plan. Now, there's actually a lot of different 401k plans um, on that. And so this is one where you definitely need to talk to uh, an advisor to get things set up for you. But for the most part, most people will set up what's called a safe harbor 401k plan. And this is why the safe harbor is important. So when you do a 401k plan, the way that it works is that You'll choose to uh, to put money into an employee's 401k account. And the way the mechanism for doing that is that the employee will decide what amount of money do I want to take out of my paycheck to put in? And then the employer then does a match of some kind. So if the employee though doesn't want to do anything, then the match, you know, the math is real easy even for a CPA like me, the match is zero. So you could be in a situation where you have, say, 10 employees, but only three of them want to participate. So, so for the other seven, it's not costing you anything for them because they're not participating. But if you have just like a regular 401k plan and none of your employees or very few of the employees are participating, it limits you as the owner for how much you can put into there. And so what they've done is they've set up what's called a safe harbor 401k plan which basically says, and there's a bunch of rules in there, but the main rule says that, um, you know, as long as you have at least a 4% match, that's usually the, the trigger point for a safe harbor plan, then it doesn't matter whether your employees participate or do not participate. You are still able to, um, you're still able to contribute the amount that you want to without having any of these top heavy rules or this all this testing stuff that gets done by third party administrators later that sometimes requires you to then give a lot of that money back and then it screws up on, on your taxes, right? So that's just kind of the, the basics of, of 401ks. And, and a lot of people, especially employers are thinking, well, I don't really care so much about the 401k. I set my 401k up like 10 years ago. I'm set here, I've got everything. But if that's you, then you might just wanna look at the new 401k plans because there's been some changes with the 401k plans uh, just in the last couple of years one of those biggest changes is adding the ability to put money in as a Roth 401k. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with investing, uh, you have traditional investments, or you have Roth investments. Usually you'll hear that in context with an IRA. Um, but what it boils down to is that with a traditional investment, that money comes out of you. You get a tax deduction today for putting that contribution in. And later when you pull the money out, um, then you'll pick it up in income when you receive it. So the Roth contributions though are different. You don't get any deduction today for that, but as that Roth grows over time, when you pull that money out in retirement account or in retirement age, then you get all that money tax-free to you. And the Roths have kind of been a little bit of a problem just because most people think of it, the Roth IRAs, and for Roth IRA, uh, there's a lot of income limitations. So if you're making you know, over a certain amount, depending on, on a lot of factors, but if you're making you know, six figures, a lot of times you are making too much money to put into a Roth. And so you can't even use that option. So a couple of years ago, they added that to the 401k. And the cool thing is, is that with the 401k, there are no income limitations. So you can make like a million dollars a year and you could still use a Roth 401k and put money into that um, just the same way that you would put money into a uh, into a traditional IRA. And so, uh, so that option has now even expanded. So now you also have the option to, uh, when you're doing the employer match, the employer match can be both traditional and Roth. 
And then there's something else that probably very few people know about, but with some of these newer con with these newer plans, they have something called after-tax contributions, which means if you max out the amount that you put into a 401k, uh, there's something called after-tax contributions that allows you to continue to put money in, even though you don't get as all of the tax deductions for them. Uh, with a 401k, you can also do employee loans. So if an employee needs money for whatever reason, instead of having them hit you up for that, like as in a, like a payroll advance, they can actually go to the 401k uh, provider and they can take out loans up to $50,000 and make payments back to their own account. And then there's creditor protection on money that's inside of a 401k uh, in most states that's better than the creditor protection if you just have money into an IRA. So if you haven't looked at the new 401k plans, there's just like a ton of different features that are in here. But let's take a look when we let's take a look at the actual numbers now of what it looks like when you add a 401k plan for yourself. So here we'll do like just a typical safe harbor plan. Let's say that the 4% uh, that the employee contributes is $100 per month. And so the employer is going to match that. So our match, the cost to us is $100, but what the employer receives is that, or the, I'm sorry, the employee receives is the $100 that they got from, from you, the employer, but because they had to put $100 of their own money in, they get a tax deduction for that, meaning they benef their benefit for your $100 contribution is actually 122. And that's just if they do the minimum. Uh, if they decide that they want to put more money in, which we always recommend as tax advisors, even though we're not financial guys, um, but we always recommend that you really want to, to put as much money as you can into your retirement accounts, they actually can put in significantly more than $100 per month into their plans. And if we take a look at the next slide, we'll be able to see that in 2024, and again, these numbers here are all, uh, are all changing, but in 2024, the maximum that a person can put into their 401k is $23,000. If you're over 50, then you can do what's called a catch-up contribution of, of an additional 7,500. And then your maximum amount that you can defer if you're under 50 is $66,000 a year. Um, and if you're over 50, the maximum amount that you can defer in one year is 73,500 on that. Now, if you're thinking about adding one of these plans, like if you've never had one of these plans, uh, we're not gonna go into the details of these because they're a little bit complicated, but just know that there are several tax credits that are available. One, to help you to offset the startup costs. Uh, two, for some employers, you can actually get a tax credit for some of the contributions that you are making. Um, so in that previous slide where we showed that your cost was $100 per month, um, in some cases with some plans, you can actually get that $100 credited back to you, meaning that the employee gets their $122 and it doesn't actually cost you anything out of pocket. And then there are some changes that are going into effect next year with something that's called automatic enrollment. Um, and so if you have a plan that signs you up for that, there's also credits available for that. So those are those get to be super complicated, but just know that in addition to the tax benefits that we're talking about today, there are other credits that are available that help you to defray the cost of being in a 401k plan. Great. And then want to open it up for the Q&A. If there's any other, any questions on the 401k stuff, it's, it's so invaluable. I had a question for you, um, Adam, that was kind of resonating with me. So, for retirement plan contribution limits, can you double up like both the traditional and the Roth at the like at the same time? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so what happens is that with these plans, you can pick and choose. So you can have you can have all Roth, you can have all traditional, you can have some Roth, and you can have some traditional. But everything gets underneath that one bucket that says the the total of the traditional and the Roth together can't exceed those. And if for some reason, like in a, in a, mm -hmm. a employee happens to be working with, with two different companies and they have two different 401k plans, they also can't double up by being in two different 401k plans. Gotcha. That's great. Thanks. 
Okay, and then one more benefit that's not really a benefit, but I wanted to throw in here uh, as well, is something called the accountable plan. So um, this is another thing that's kind of gained more popularity since they changed the tax law in 2018. So in 2018 is when they, they eliminated the vast majority of the itemized deductions. One of those being something called unreimbursed employee business expenses. So a lot of times you're an employee, uh, for whatever reason, you have to pay for things on behalf of the business, which I feel like is not fair, but that's just the way that it is. Like maybe you're driving and you're not getting reimbursed, or maybe you're having to do some travel or, or something like that. Uh, in the past, you were able to take that as a deduction, as, a, as an itemized deduction, but that went away in 2018. And so now the employee doesn't have any way of getting a tax break for that. So that's where something called an accountable plan comes in. And so with an accountable plan, what happens is that uh, once you have this document on file, you're able to reimburse your employees for the expenses that they pay and you'll still get the tax deduction, but better still, when the employee gets the reimbursement, they don't have to pay any taxes on this. So when you're looking to, to put together like a benefits package, you can say, hey, you know what? We plan on, you know, because of your job, we know that you're going to be driving or we know that you're going to be using your phone. Um, and so uh, the benefit of using the accountable plan is that you're able to basically reimburse the employee for something that they are already paying. So it doesn't really come out of their pocket to do this. But as the employer, you get the benefit because now you're not paying any payroll taxes on those reimbursements on that. So when you use this type of a plan, so a couple of things are required. So one, you actually have to have a plan. Uh, you can't just say we have an accountable plan. Um, with this type of a plan, this is now where you actually do have to have receipts. So they would have to substantiate that, hey, I had this meal, I have this phone usage, I had this travel or I had this um, this automobile mileage is what I'm being re reimbursed for. They have to actually provide that to the employer. And then the employer then uh, reimburses those expenses, usually within 30 days. Uh, and that's how that, that works. Now, the caveat to this is that you can't just go and say, we're going to pay for everybody's phones, right? So like, let's say that you have a like a factory right? The people working on the factory floor, they're not using their phone for business, okay? So you can't just say, well, I'm going to give you something when it doesn't actually relate to their job. But if you've got an employee, for instance, that's on call that you're calling on evenings or weekends or uh, or needs to be available like that, or is even just out, out traveling and then they need to be able to use their phone, then that's something that the employer can reimburse for. So you got to be a little careful that you're not abusing this. Uh, but on our example here that we're going to show you, um, we're going to say that you are out of business. You decide that you're going to reimburse, say, $75 a month of an employee's phone bill because they're using it for business. So this is another example where you're paying $75. The employee is paying $75. So it's really it's like another one of these 100 percent relationships, except for because you're kind of treating that as compensation you're not paying the 10 or 11 percentage or so of payroll taxes on that money. So it actually helps you out as the employer because you're not paying those those payroll taxes. So, hey, uh, Adam. Yes. We had a question in the, the Q&A and it said, uh, my employees pay for licensure every year. Can we reimburse them for that? So if it's a license that's required for your job, then you could. Yeah, because okay. again, like that's an exact situation there where that employee no longer can um, no longer can deduct those costs on their own. Um, so if the employer says, yes, that's required for your job, uh, the licensure or if for whatever reason, like if they need continuing education and uh, mm -hmm. in order to get that license, then the employer pays for that. Um, so those are examples of where it's better for the employee um, or the employer to reimburse for those uh, since the employer can get a tax deduction. Perfect. On that. So um, so again, there's, there's a ton of different benefits and I just kind of covered some of the popular ones, but there are other benefits too. There's dependent care benefits. 
there's education benefits. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. that are out there. Um, but just using this, so like in this example here, um, let me just rehash these numbers here a little bit. So when we talked about this first, under the cash only situation where the employer was just going to give $500 to the employee and then the employee would receive $462. That's the first example that we talked about where, um, where the employee is only getting 84% of the benefit of that money, even though as the employer, I'm expecting 110%. So if we do, if we replace that cash only um, raise and basically replace it with uh, with the benefits that we talked about. Uh, again, we had $500 of benefits that, uh, that we went through with all the slides. Because of some of the different tax savings, the employee receives $599 of savings. So they're actually getting 120% value for the 500 that, that I'm giving them. So now, in my mind, I feel like it's not so bad to ask for 110% on that when I'm giving them 120 uh, on that. So... So when you're then looking at your benefits package, uh, you don't have to do all of those. Like you can pick and choose and you can find like the ones that are right for you. But I want to just give you just a couple of caveats because with all the businesses that we have done work for, uh, we've seen this kind of go like, like bad because people will not follow the procedures necessarily that, that go with their, their benefits. So uh, so a couple of things that I would just want you to make sure that you're that you're aware of is that when you're looking to do your benefits package, like don't go in and just say, uh, you know, if you're meeting with like with an advisor that's going to help you with this, don't just go in and say, hey, I want a 401k plan, right? Because you'll get a 401k plan, but you really want to say, we want to look at every single option that's available for us, right? And and that benefits advisor is going to say, well, what kind of employees do you have, and what's their age range, and you know, are they married? Or are they not married? And then what's your, like the amount that you want to do? And they're going to go out there and they're going to find a lot of these things for you. Um, now, a lot of the different benefits that you're going to sign up for are not free. Like you got to pay somebody either to put them together or you got to pay somebody to administer. So before you think, hey, I'm getting this, this super great tax credit um, or this tax benefit, make sure that you understand what you have to pay for uh, on some of these things in order to get that. And then the other thing that we, you know, we're, we, we try to be sticklers on is that that documentation is important because if you're not doing, like if you don't have the right documents in place and if you're not following the rules that are set up in those, uh, in those documents, then you run the risk of if the IRS comes in or the Department of Labor comes in and then wants to do an audit on you, then you could actually have all of those uh, all of those benefits kind of clawed back and then turned into cash compensation. And here's kind of the, the sad point. And we've had a client that that's been hit with this. When this happens, like when you don't follow the rules and you get audited and you're caught, the IRS, they're not going to go to your 10 or 15 or 20 employees from three years ago and say, we need your $500 and your $1,000 or whatever. They're going to go to the employer and they're going to say, you're going to write me a check for everybody and we're going to hit you with interest penalties. That can get pretty expensive. So, so again, you want to make sure that you understand like what the benefits are, what the rules are, uh, and how you need to administer them because ultimately as the employer, you're responsible um, for that. Good. And then Adam, one, another question we have in the, in the Q&A is uh you know are these benefits available for full-time employees only so it's a tricky question because what's the definition of full-time so within a lot of the different rules right so i believe with health insurance health insurance is considered full-time when you're at i think it's 32 hours for um for retirement plans health uh full-time is considered to be i want to say like 25 hours um but a lot of these things really comes down to what you want to do. So like, for instance, if, if somebody has health insurance and you want to give them money into, the F, into their HSA, there's not, you know, there's not a rule. You could do that for part-time people. Like you decide like which ones that you're going to do. And a lot of times too, like if you've got like a kid that's working for you, uh, you might decide mm -hmm. to then craft the rules so that you can give some of those benefits 
to the kids or family members or friends or whatever. Uh, and so that's where when you're defining those benefits, that's one of the big questions that you'll be asked is that who does that apply to? Like in some cases, you can say this only applies to people that are over 21 or over 25 or who work this many hours or work in these departments and things like that. So a lot of that can be crafted, um, you know, in order for you to to allow the people that you want or or disallow the people that you don't want. Perfect. And then, Adam, I, I know you get businesses at all, you know, sizes and, and life cycles. You know, do they, do they come to you and say, hey, am I ready? <laughs> you know, am I ready to offer this? Is that is that part of what you consult with or, or how, what's your approach there? Yeah. So there's kind of like a like a two part thing. So there's there's two things that you'll need to look at when you are the business owner for this. So one. When you want to start providing benefits, you're going to go to somebody that uh, is a specialist in those benefits. And so, like, as an example, if you want to do a 401k, you'll need to go to like a third party administrator that can set up 401ks and do all the paperwork for that. Or if you want to add health insurance you're going to go to all of these different, um, you know, health insurance providers and you're going to look through all those lists and you're going to pick all of those. Um, so for most of these out there, you'll either need to find an attorney, you'll need to find some kind of a provider or somebody. And sometimes there'll be a fee for these and sometimes there won't be a fee for these. Um, what our role then is as a CPA is to say, okay, well, now that you have this in place, there's there's two kind of important things. Is that one, we wanna make sure that you've got the rules down. Um, so for instance, if you are paying somebody or or if you're allowing for pre-tax contributions, um, we wanna make sure that that's being reported correctly in your, uh, in your W-2. And then the other thing is that we wanna make sure that in your accounting records, the way that you're paying for all of that uh, actually gets recorded properly in the accounting record because what you don't want to do is you don't want to like go and set all this stuff up because you're getting all this tax savings. And then you don't talk to your CPA. We don't see it in your records because you didn't tell us about it. We don't know to ask. And so we're not going to necessarily get you those tax benefits or fill out those forms because you didn't tell us how to do that. So we'll help you to, to calculate some of those on the front end, but definitely then having it so that it's in your accounting records properly so that we can fill out the proper forms to give you the tax deductions or the tax credits. Um, and that way we don't overlook some of those things. Perfect. Perfect explanation. Yeah. And then, so, you know, obviously, Hey, as Adam's covered the, the comprehensive employee benefits, it, it, it truly is a, a win-win strategy when the time is right. Um, you know, those pre-tax deductions, um, the section 125s, the dependent cares, um, so useful. And then, you know, when it's right, the health savings account, and then, you know, the tax saving opportunity for businesses, you know, so, so critical to, to utilize those. And then I think another great strategy is, man, when, when you have it in place and, you know, those numbers that Adam shared with us where you're actually paying more, like, you know, letting your employees know, let it, letting them know what, what their dollar looks like and reminding them of, of, of the benefits you're providing. I think it goes a long way to increase their satisfaction and, and help you really retain, um, you know, the good employees that you have. So, cool. And then, um, you know, one, one thing about advanced FHR is, you know, we, we, we do a lot of that and, and we can take the burden um, of having to have multiple vendors and entities supply um, those benefits. So, um, you know, I kind of mentioned it, but a attracting and retaining talent is critical, you know, um, really surrounding the circumference around your employee base from hire to retire so they can find all those benefits and live comfortably, achieve a lot of personal family financial goals. And then they, they know that they have it um, at, at, at one stop um, is, is, is critical. And, and we're happy to, to be a um, able to offer all that. And then, you know, last, this, this graphic is, 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 is very important. So, you know, we, we offer implementation op options, right? So um, we, you know, we, with the, with the, with our PEO company and with PEOs, you'll find, you know, you see your company and for instance, using advanced FHR, we'll, we'll hit on each five of those critical components um, to really, you know, surround your business. 
So from your payroll to any of the HR administrations, you know, healthcare and benefits, and then obviously really looking at your risk and compliance and, and workers comp and just everything surrounding the business and then being able to provide, you know, all those, um, all those amazing, you know, benefits that, that Adam went through is, you know, you can do it all, all in one and, and it, it usually provides a, a ton of relief for the, for you, the business owner, and then a, a, a huge satisfaction boost um, with your employee base. And then, um, yeah, we'll open it up as we close uh, for any final Q and A's. We do have one right now, and it is: What is the minimum number of employees required? Um, I am not exactly sure. Maybe for our, our services, you know, we typically see clients, you know, as, as little as three or so employees. Um, obviously, as you move up in employee count our services become more and more um, beneficial when we're able to kind of, you know, put a whole, a whole plan, a package around um, a few different employees. So, but we're happy to talk at, at any size. And really one of our, one of our strategies, especially with my business development managers is to really, you know, at, at, at the very least leave you with beneficial information um, going forward and you know we love to partner with with Adam and his group and and get people talking to 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 train CPAs to really help businesses get stronger. Um, so that's that's really that's really our, one of our main main goals is is just to reflect that way and 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 help you go forward no matter what you decide to do. Any other questions out there? Got a few more minutes till we've hit the time. Um, while anybody could be thinking of those, here's our, our goodbye screen, I guess you could say. So got our, our phone number there. You've got all of uh, Adam's information right there below. And we even have a convenient um, you know, scan code if uh, you'd like to schedule a meeting that way. And again, we'd be uh, more than happy to talk to you or direct you um, in any capacity. And I know Adam would, would love to do the same. Got another question for Adam. Does Adam offer tax planning? Yeah, that's actually a great question. So with our firm, so we specialize in helping business owners. Um, so that's primarily all the work that we do uh, is with business owners. And a key component of that is tax planning, uh, because really, in order to get the benefits from the tax code that you know that you'll hear people talking about on social media or whatever, uh, all that kind of stuff has to be done real time throughout the year in order to get a good result at the end of the year. If you just wait until the end of the year, you know, and dump a box shoe, like a shoebox full of receipts on us in March in order to do the tax return, like at that point, your options are basically over for things that you can do. And so with, uh, with a lot of our clients, and what we focus on is being able to talk with you, meet with you throughout the year, see how things are going, see what things can change in order to improve your tax situation before the year is over. Yeah. Glad, glad Adam mentioned that, you know, that the proactive approach to this is, is always best and important to have a tax professional that you can talk to in, in that regard. And, uh, you know, Adam's done a great job with that and, and the clients that we've that we've had and 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 heard from with him. So um love love that question. And then one more, I need to make an appointment with Adam. So awesome. Uh he will uh he'll get that. Um uh, you can get his information right there. And uh that that's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, hey, we'll, uh, if there's any other questions, feel free to, um, to answer, to ask them. Um, but, hey, I want to thank you for, for jumping on uh, with us. Uh, really grateful for the time and preparation that Adam and, and his team spent in delivering this content. Um, very, very practical, very plug and play. And, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely encourage you to make an appointment with, with Adam and uh, – also, uh, 
grateful for for Becky and and uh, for joining on and uh, helping answering questions. And uh, we'd love to get in touch with you and and talk further. Um, we will definitely send this out um, so you can have the recording and with all the content that comes with it for everybody that registered. And uh, we look forward to talking with you all again soon. Thanks, everyone.